what do you say? So Christina, if you would not mind pulling up the slide deck for us, that would be fabulous. That's great. So if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Awesome, thank you. So we would just like to take just a, a moment to introduce ourselves, uh, and that is our equity, diversity, inclusion team here at the State Board, as well as members of our broader State Board team within the Ed Division, really critical and collaborative partners in this work with us. So with that, I'll go ahead and start. Um, my name is Ha Win. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I live, work, and play from a converted office uh, I'm sorry, a converted closet um, that I now uh, dub as my coffice, which I think is a thing. <laughs> um, and I live, work, and play on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish and Puyallup tribes. And I have the beautiful honor of serving as the State Board's Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And I'll go ahead also and introduce Melissa Williams, who is not able to be here with us today. She is pulled away. Uh, to help hire a policy associate within our ed division. So really important work as well. Uh, so she is doing that work uh, for us. Uh, but Melissa Williams was is a uh, policy associate with the EDI team uh, alongside Christina, who will be introducing herself next as well. And Melissa plays a, a really pivotal role in leading internal agency equity efforts uh, within the professional development series that we've uplifted, as well as other initiatives that mirror much of what the colleges are doing, or at least we attempt to do that to the best of our ability. Um, and also a lead role in uh, Senate bill uh, implementation and te providing technical assistance for uh, Senate bills 5194 and 5227. So that is Melissa Williams uh, in a little bit of a nutshell, just a little sliver of her. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and hand the virtual mic over to Christina Pleasance. Thank you, Ha. My name is Christina Pleasance. I serve as the administrative assistant for the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Office here with Ha and Melissa. I've been here for about seven months now, and it's been wonderful with this team and agency. I'm here to offer any support if you need anything. Um, Claudine, would you oh. like? Great, thank you, Christina. Oh, are you there? Can can well, you know, Christina, still hear me? We can hear you. <laughs> okay, great. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I thought I had a tech hiccup on my end. Uh, so thank you, Christina, and I'll go ahead now hand off the virtual mic to our. Uh, State Board colleagues, uh, Dr. Claudine Richardson and uh, Lynn Palmentier Holder. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is um, Claudine Richardson. I serve as the Policy Associate for Guided Pathways in the Student Success Center and Strategic Initiatives. And then um, my director, who wishes with all their heart they could be here, Monica Wilson, serves as our director for um, the Student Success Center and Strategic Initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. How about Lynn? Why well, Haskell Holt. Hello and good day to everyone. My name is Lynn Palmentier Holder and I'm the Director of Tribal Relations and Curriculum Development. It's a new position. I've been on board at the State Board for since mid-November. Um, we've been moving and shaking and, and building relationships uh, with uh, all the different councils and commissions and um, I'm real excited to be here today and share some some good information. So, Lim Lim, thank you for having me. Great. Thank you, Lynn. Christina, do you mind going to the next slide? Great. Thank you. Uh, so before we start our time together, we'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous lands across our good state and honor the oftentimes invisible labor that contributes to it in boundless ways. So I've asked my colleagues to lean into this work with me. And so, Andrew, I'll go ahead and let you kick us off. Thanks, Ha. Um, so our land acknowledgement um, is uh, SBCTC acknowledges that our community resides on the ancestral lands of the First Peoples. The office of the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges is located in Olympia on the Coast Salish lands of the Nisqually, Kalitz, and Squatskin peoples. Um, we ask you to join us in celebrating the indigenous tribes of Washington by acknowledging their ancestral lands, their communities, and the past, present, and future generations of the Native peoples across our good state. Uh, 
And for our labor acknowledgement, uh, we also acknowledge that our nation and our institutions have benefited and profited from the free enslaved labor of Black people. We recognize the entangled and interconnected histories of indigenous peoples who were forcibly removed from their land and the plight of the Black people who were forcibly brought to it. We acknowledge the enduring impacts of the African diaspora and lift up the contributions, talents, and dreams of Black communities. Importantly, we also acknowledge the immigrant and refugee labor that has contributed to the building of this country within our labor force, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, and undocumented peoples. We recognize and honor their important contributions to our good state and to this nation. I think I'm passing it to Claudine. Thank you, Margarita. Our commitment. Lastly, we know that such statements only become truly meaningful when coupled with authentic relationships and sustained commitment. As such, we commit to building our collective understanding and action to foster authentic connections with our communities of color to affect meaningful change within our institutions and communities. And Lynn? Why, why is hello or welcome? Again, um, I want to make a comment uh, specifically around the land acknowledgement and recognize that the intention of land, land acknowledgements are a, a positive statement. And we know that um, they come with good intentions. Um, what we've experienced, and I say we, I, I speak from a, a tribal perspective, um, today, we'll talk a little bit about um, our sovereign nations and our 29 federally recognized tribes within Washington state, and also non-recognized tribes within Washington state. So uh, before there was a state, these were all traditional territories. Throughout time and memorial, these, these lands were already connected to first peoples. And so what we have found is that many of these good intentions in their statements uh, uh, have been developed without the input of the local tribes. And sometimes um, that has, uh, uh, we have uh, formalized these land acknowledgements um, with uh, identifying the, the traditional territories um, in, in the wrong way with the wrong people. So um, what my work will be doing is to continue to help uh, uh, bridge these authentic, meaningful, long lasting, reciprocal relationships with our first peoples of Washington state, those sovereign nations, and have encourage all of our community and technical colleges to build relationships, engage those um, sovereign nations, and get to know the traditional territories that your community and technical college resides, the home that you, you live in, the place that you work, where we raise our families, get to know whose traditional territory it is. It's time that the truth in a, of our history uh, be told, but it can only be told with the participation of the voices of, of the indigenous people of Washington State. So Lim Lim, thank you for listening. Thank you, Lynn. Always the, just having you join us at the SBCTC team, as well as being involved and in, um, leaning into this work with you further has been incredibly phenomenal. I appreciate everything that you bring to it and reminding us uh, what it means to be authentic in this work and how we can continue to evolve. So thank you so much for that. Christina, great, thank you. Uh, so just a quick purview of what we will be lifting up today. Uh, we'll share a quick overview uh, there in front of you of Senate Bill 5194, and then especially elevate the opportunities for uh, thinking about the collaborative collaboration and integration between important system initiatives like guided pathways and some of the work that Lynn just mentioned that she is uh, spearheading across our system. And then of course, always, always to amplify the incredible efforts from our college leaders here that you'll get a chance to meet with and, and listen to who have approached this important body of work with a, a really clear focus on centering the experiences and voices of our uh, black indigenous um, students, faculty and staff of color. So with that, we'll go ahead and get to the next slide. And I'm just gonna do that quick overview for you. Uh, Senate Bill 5194, particularly section three. So the, the overall uh, bill was a, a, a pretty complex, complicated bill. Uh, for purposes of today's 
session, we're concentrating on section three of that bill, and that is around the requirement for colleges to create uh, the DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion strategic plans, um, especially notably utilizing an inclusive process that includes faculty, staff, students, and other stakeholders as the, the development of those DEI plans are lifted up. So uh, in a nutshell, it's a, one overarching deliverable, and that is the plan itself. But there's some key components within that plan that you see in front of you here. Uh, many of the colleges may have already been uh, uh, doing this work. It's already been integrated into strategic plans. You'll hear about that uh, with our college leaders today. Uh, also recognizing that colleges are at different varying levels of that work and so trying to provide some guidance and what that means to uh, begin the work and then fully integrate it possibly with the goal of um, uh, enveloping it within the overall college plan if at all possible. And then, of course, deadlines around this plan beginning uh, July 30th, uh, just right, right around the corner here we're looking at let's see two months out um, our EDI team will also be sending out uh, reminders across the board to each of the colleges as well in regards to these timelines uh, but beginning July 30th uh, and every two years thereafter all colleges must submit biennial DEI strategic plans to the state board that would be inclusive at many uh, at minimum what you see in front of you in regards to those uh, aspects so the culturally appropriate student outreach program peer mentoring strategies uh, the faculty diversity program as well as any dei definitions that are utilized uh, within the plan itself and any re uh, subsequent reports with that plan and then front facing externally front facing on your websites so those are so the takeaway requirements of section three in regards to the dei strategic plans and then just to touch upon this piece as well, um, again, colleges must create those plans, inclusive process to include broadly across the campus. Um, we are, our team is also available to review any draft DEI strategic plans if colleges would like us to take a peek at that. I know we've been, uh, been called upon to talk to a number of different individuals individually, and then uh, certainly exec teams that have some good questions around this as well. Uh, but prior to submission beginning July 30th, um, uh, prior to July 30th, excuse me, that that is something that uh, we are available to help review. Um, and then just a, a, a point towards the uh, allocation, the fiscal investments for the colleges received this fiscal year for uh, uplifting this work. And that is the, uh, each college received 125,000 for this current year. Um, funds must be used in the year received. Um, there is an allowable one-time rollover uh, for fiscal year 22-23. So what that means is as you receive the 125 and as you see the June 30th, 2022 deadline coming to expend those funds and uh, there's still some funds remaining or good portions of that fund remaining towards this work, uh, we've been able to uh, utilize um, receive approval for a one-time rollover. So that 125 can roll over into the next fiscal year. Again, that's a one-time rollover. Uh, subsequent allocations though, will be dispersed now every year in the amount of 62,500 as opposed to a 125,000 bulk. Um, so those subsequent years, I want to emphasize at this point in time that once colleges receive the annual 62.5, there will be no rollovers. So uh, that amount of funds would have to be exhausted by the end of the fiscal year as it's received. And then I mentioned the submission process. Thank you, Christina, for keeping up with me as I'm running a different slide deck. <laughs> Thank you so much. I just noticed that. Uh, so submission process, again, beginning July 30th, uh, 2022 or prior to. Uh, we've also had some uh, questions from colleges in regards to that deadline. Um, you'll notice that the language is beginning July 30th, 2022. Uh, what we've also responded to colleges who are in positions now uh, in, in their timeline to fully redevelop their uh, call overall strategic plan, how that might work to utilize that opportunity to integrate this plan into that broader plan. Um, so for instance, there's a a call if you're a college that is looking to begin that process of developing the strategic plan for your college 
and that is after the July 30th deadline. Uh, we have uh, tra uh, we have uh, given guidance um, for those colleges to be able to really do that meaningful work uh, of developing that plan alongside the overall college plan, as opposed to establishing a set aside uh, uh, a separate DEI plan. So with that, there is a template that we have created for colleges to be able to provide a progress report towards that endeavor, as well as the opportunity, of course, to submit a final plan for those colleges that it makes sense to do so. Uh, and that could be for several colleges who may have already started this work prior to legislation ever landing. Um, and you'll hear a couple of examples of that today and what that looks like in, in various stages. Uh, and the template is available in that full Google Drive that Christina popped into the chat. Uh, let us know if you're not able to access that, we can send it your way as well. Uh, but it's just there to help colleges be thinking through uh, the process of uh, making sure that the legislation and the uh, requirements from the legislation are met within that progress report, um, as well as at, at a minimum, uh, as well as any other good work that you want to add to that as uh, that is all helpful to you, feel free to use that template. And you're uh, able to submit that directly to us at the email address. Oh, Christina, I just saw that you've moved forward too fast. There you go, thank you. <laughs> to be able to submit the, your DEI plan, uh, final plan and or progress report uh, via our team email there that you see edi at sbctc.edu. And, and again, you'll receive similar reminders. Many of you may have already received that for your campus climate assessments uh, that are also due beginning July 1. And just as a reminder to the, for colleges who are already completed that and are in a space to be able to utilize those findings and the results of your campus climate assessments to make sure to integrate that into the development of your DEI strategic plan. And the submission uh, can come from a college president or a designated authority. We went, we went in that direction um, rather than having our, the DEO officer, if you will, uh, submit the plan on behalf of the college uh, because not all colleges have that designated authority at this time, uh, but all colleges have a college president. So if the submission can come from the college president, that is uh, fabulous. And then hereafter, again, colleges will be required to submit their plans biennially every two years. And this is just, oh, next slide, Christina. That's great, thank you. Uh, and this is just a, a quick snapshot of that strategic plan template in order for colleges to be able to utilize uh, the template uh, to provide pro progress findings on their plan. And you'll see that we made sure to include the components of that plan um, as um, written into the bill. So those requirements within the bill explicitly, as well as um, having colleges think through sort of the overall goals and objectives and as well as integrating success metrics into that uh, plan. And I think I'll just pause here for just a second to see if there's any questions so far and what I shared almost rather rapidly. Thank you, Christina, just put in our, uh, in the chat, the link to the uh, webpage as well. So I can't, any questions that may have emerged in, in anything that I might've shared? And do know we are available to answer any questions you might have to feel free to reach out via email or directly to us more than happy to, to um, answer any questions or any uh, provide any kind of guidance that might be helpful to you. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to the critical partners in this work that I mentioned before, my colleagues here at the State Board with uh, Lynn and, and Claudine and uh, lifting up Monica Wilson in this space as well as they run important leadership implementation of guided pathways at a system wide level as well as the good work that Lynn shared earlier. So I'll go ahead and give that up to, I think it's Claudine, yes, Dr. Richardson? Yes. All right, hello everyone. Bon Benny. 
Um, and thank you for being here. Bon Benny means welcome. And so um, I'm Claudine. I serve as the policy associate for Guided Pathways in the Student Success Center and Strategic Initiatives. And my director is Monica Wilson, who I mentioned earlier would have um, fought tooth and nail to be here, but they had um, a competing requirement that needed immediate attention. And so I'll go ahead and go through the Guided Pathways components really quickly, um, which is slides 13, 14, and 15, if you have access to them. And so one of the things I will note and that has been noted is that when you think about Guided Pathways, you're really thinking about student success. And student success cannot be attained alone without thinking about the success across our system of our faculty and staff members. And so we recognize that the intersections of that and what is that work in action does not necessarily fall into neat little categories of how to do it. And there's a lot of accountability that's taking place in assessment that you're already doing on your campuses that tie into your equity plan. And so I want to just remind you that our success as a system system is measured by our student success and thus each other, our collective success. And at SBCTC, we view our success through the collective accomplishments that each of you make um, in our system. And so when you think about Guided Pathways implementation, there's really a couple of areas that come into play. There are the essential and emergent practices to meet the universal and targeted completion goals, right? So along with Lumina Foundation and what um, Washington has committed to among the community and technical colleges, we think about how do we close those institutional and economic and social equity gaps that show up in higher education around comprehensive program and pathway mapping that turns into our educational plans, dedicated and career counseling that not only maps out what the student's experience is when they get here, but from inquiry to the point of transfer and moving into their career. Evidence-based practices on closing those opportunity gaps for our historically underserved populations with regards to our primary um, dimension within the diversity wheel, as well as those secondary dimensions of identity um, as well. Equity component academic advising services, which many of you have worked on in your work plans, equity competent career development programming, right? So how are we creating those high impact practices that not only show up in that career fair, but that show up in relationship to their classroom experience, right? And then provide them tracks of opportunity and mentorship in the form of internships, research, scholarship, as well as mentorship. Clear information regarding um, financial aid and financial literacy, so our students can understand how the decisions they are making will inform their future, and as well as help them understand how to, to build that understanding of what these practices mean moving forward. Um, as they transition out of the CTCs. And then many of you are aware of that anti-racist curriculum initiative and teaching practices, which are part of the Guided Pathways Essential Practices to support our students inside the classroom as well as outside. And then we couldn't necessarily do all this work without tools, technology tools. And so many of you have adopted tools um, as well as looking at how integration of those tools work with CTC Link um, needs to support your students and each other as well as making sure that they're in alignment. And so to do that, one of the things that this plan outlines that Ha mentions is the need for peer and professional learning. And many of you have been um, privy to, have experienced the Guided Pathways um, Student Success Institutes and Retreats. But mind you, there are other statewide institutes, cohort retreats, communities of inquiry, practice, and care, and workshops that also support this equity focus um, within your work plans um, that are within the Student Success Center Strategic Initiatives and beyond. 
And then we also can think about that. What are the roundtable summits and facilitated brave conversations around our CTC majority and dominant group members that are necessary to move equity work forward um, for those invisible participants um, in higher education who might feel minoritized, marginalized, and silenced, including the need for speaker series and data labs. Additionally, collaboration and community building is critical because it strengthens and builds and maintains our relationships and partnerships. And so um, currently the Student Success Center and many others are working with Lynn um, to better understand the relationships between the tribal governments and organizations. We're working with community members, which is critical for equity work to understand the industry association and labor organization needs that focus on learning outcomes and align with community values and in and industry to ensure that we're not just graduating our students, but we're graduating our students at the intersection of what they love to do and with the understanding that we are there trying to support the closing of economic gaps. And then we're doing that to expand the partnerships with private foundations and research organizations to support us in this work. Because without an appropriate funding model to do this work, sometimes the realization of how we do this work can sometimes be in conflict with the pen. And then also strategic initiatives. Um, many of you have been, and don't quote me on what the acronym is, y'all, I don't know it. Many of you <laughs> have been privy to the MC Burning Glass alumni data that will tie into the collaboration as well as the, the peer and professional learning and guided pathways implementation to know what's happening with our students, what jobs they're attaining, what their starting incomes are, where they're going um, in terms of the career and how soon and where they're transitioning. So there's also the implementation of guided pathways to careers focused on workforce, economic recovery, and incumbent worker training apprenticeships. So again, those high impact practices. And then um, CTC link as a guided pathways integration as part of our strategic initiatives, right? And so um, those are some of the connections that we see visible and that many of you have seen visible, um, for example, in the Student Success Institute and in the Guided Pathways Retreat, um, as well as the need to um, diversity, diversify our faculty and staff members. Um, all right, next slide, please. All right. And so one of the ways that we've exemplified this collaboration and just strategic initiatives on how we move this work forward is to understand the, the critical lived reality that many of you are trying to do multiple things at multiple times and are extremely taxed in doing so. And so as you have submitted a work plan for the year of 2022, 2023, we will take a pause in that we will strategically analyze, review, and support you as best as we can in determining what the next steps are and take a sabbatical for the 2023-2024 work plan, right? And so thus you've given us so much information. So from this work plan, um, it will allow us to better understand local needs and the assessment. Um, you already have things coming out to you from the scale of adoption survey that's coming out um, um, from community, hold on. I can't even CCRC y'all, acronyms y'all, my dyslexia is acting up. <laughs> and then um, you have we have the coaching reports that will inform our work. We have event evaluations. We have institutional grants and reports, particularly for Washington College Spark. And we have the spring 2023 Student Success Institutes again, as well as the retreats. So we recognize that we're putting the work plan on sabbatical for the next academic year because there's so much rich information that we already collect and that you have already provided to us that will inform our journey moving forward. Next slide, please. Okay, oops, yeah. <laughs> so the work plans of the future, 
again, will be in alignment and integration with other institutional plans, right? Will be evidence-based and action-oriented to make sure that we're not only providing you what you want and what you need, but also the areas of where we see a need for growth to accomplish the essential practices. And it will be continued to be equity-focused. Uh, many of you are aware that for over three years now, there has always been a conversation about equity at the Guided Pathways Retreats and Institutes, and there has been a strong move forward in integrated diversity, equity, and inclusion questions in the Guided Pathways Work Plan. So we will continue with that, and we will make sure that what you submit to us is worth your time and encouraged um, by us hold on that's that's wrong english but we will ensure that it's worth your time because we will ensure that we're using that information correctly um, to inform our learning agenda and we will let you know how we're doing so right thank you Good afternoon again. <clears throat> My name is Lynn Palminger Holder and Director for Tribal Relations and Curriculum Development. So I'm very excited to uh, be here with all of you. I'm going to move through some slides, give you a little bit of background. Um, why intersect uh, guided pathways and tribal relations? Um, well, uh, number one, when we were focusing on student success and we look at data, we're constantly analyzing data uh, regarding our performance um, and uh, how many of our students are we enrolling, how many are dropping out, how many are we retaining, how many are completing. And if we have a vision statement around racial equity and uh, anti-racism and serving the most uh, historically underserved populations, the N within the population symbol is um, uh, uh, the population is very small for, for American Indians and Alaska Natives across all data in education and especially higher education. The N actually represents the highest disparities among education and employment uh, data. Uh, it's unfortunate um, that we uh, tend to be uh, in a ca category of deficiencies uh, in relationship to education and um, employment issues, but trends. But the reality is that uh, we are still dealing with uh, intergenerational historical trauma. So uh, the, when we're talking about student success, we really need to uh, strategize in a meaningful and positive way. Um, and that means uh, that we uh, really need to uh, establish some specific goals and understand the population, not think that we can look at data, we can um, analyze that data, we'll pull up some research studies and, and look at findings and align that those findings with this population. Uh, American Indian and Alaska Native tribes have very diverse histories, some very common uh, traumas that have been uh, uh, they've experienced over time. Um, I'll give my personal uh, story uh, from my maternal side of my family. I am the first in four generations on my maternal side to be at, to be raised in the same home as my mother. In other words, my mother, since the age of four, was raised in boarding schools. Um, she dropped out at 15 when she became pregnant with me, and she uh, delivered, became a mother at 16. My grandmother was, a, was in boarding schools, and my great-grandmother um, back in the late 1800s was one of the first uh, to be removed from her family and put in boarding schools. When uh, it wasn't like going to a boarding school to learn um, uh, to speak a new language and 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 assimilate into a population where you're going to be honored and respected. It was actually uh, a, an effort to unlearn everything you knew about your history, your connection to the land, the traditions that have been uh, been uh, shared uh, since time immemorial. Um, so so they were th those traumas and and breakup in family systems continue to impact our, our people today. So this is a crisis when it comes to tribal relations. And fortunately, uh, we are uh, together in a, 
space where uh, not only federal law, but state laws are, are coming to um, understand the importance of building government to government relationships through tribal consultation with these sovereign nations that exist within our states. So um, with that said, um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to change the slide, please. I'm really excited to um, collaborate with uh, Monica and uh, uh, Claudine and, and the success, Student Success Center. Um, this is a great marriage for us. Um, I believe that uh, we are um, at a time and place at the state board where um, uh, leader, leadership is stating that they don't want strategic plans that are written in text put in a report and put on, on a shelf. It's time that we get those uh, uh, plans um, uh, in collaboration with the, with the voices that need to be participating and helping us um, mediate some of these crises that we're in. And so um, I, I'm, I'm enthused, I'm excited uh, to be working here at the state board uh, and meeting the many councils and commissions that I've been meeting and the, and the priorities about moving forward. So, we, so the goal here is to intersect our, our guided pathways and our strategies with tribal relations. It also is a goal that we uh, are encouraging all 34 community and technical colleges as you begin to develop your DEI plans you have a specific goal in there about um, engaging your local tribes, uh, building um, an, an annual meeting of uh, greet and meet, uh, maybe just having uh, um, uh, looking at uh, their, uh, their tribal governance structure, learning about their business and economic development um, uh, plans and, and, and their enterprises, taking a look at their workforce, um, tri tribes have uh, their own governance, they have their own business and economic developments, which means they have their own tribal economies, um, they have their own health clinics, they have their, many of them have their own, uh, 20 out of the 29 tribes in Washington have their own early childhood uh, centers uh, and immersion schools, some of them have K-12 schools, and a couple of them have their own colleges. So uh, these governments are uh, roaring, and some of them are some of the largest um, engine economic engines in the in the regions and uh, there are a number of reports that have been written and analyzed and and about 70 percent of the populations are employees that tribes hire in their communities are non-native so when we talk about um, indigenizing the academy uh, bringing uh, uh, developing american indian indigenous studies curriculum uh, integrating tribal language into our, our coursework, into a world language and transferable to four-year universities. When we're talking about building partnerships through workforce uh, programs like tribal gaming management, um, uh, promoting CNAs uh, for the tribal clinics, um, when, we're, when we're developing those, those opportunities, we really need to be thinking that, that um, on the majority of the employees that we're working with are non-tribal as well. And so when we bring in uh, a tribal liaison to work in our, in our institutions, we're actually bringing in a resource, someone who helps facilitate that, that bridging the, the uh, relationships between the college and the tribes. And those relationships uh, become very reciprocal. Um, in addition, we bring in our indigenous knowledge, which is indigenous knowledge, every one of our 29 tribes, are very unique and have their own uh, ways of knowing and being. So their epistemologies are very diverse. Uh, in my own tribe, I'm a member of the Colville Confederated Tribe, which is actually a confederation of 12 tribes. I'm a member of seven of those tribes. So uh, these tribes were uh, uh, formed not by our tribal, uh, our tribal leaders, but by the federal government. And so these, these tribes um, may not be uh, defined uh, on paper or uh, when, you're, when, when we're uh, reading anthropological reports about these bands and, and, and these practices, maybe they're, they're not as accurate as, as, as those of us from in, inside these tribes know and understand. So it's very important that we begin to look at a collaborative strategy and we do it through federal policy and state policy 
and RCW 43376, which I'm so proud that HA has damn packed. Uh, it is a, a government to government relationship building between state agencies and the federally recognized tribes. And uh, those relationship building begin through tribal consultation. And that means an engagement. It doesn't mean sending an email, hey, we try to get all the tribe, we send them emails, we invited them to a meeting. It means actually going out and engaging those tribes and um, because they are sovereign nations. Next slide. This is just a, a image of the 29 federally recognized tribes in Washington state. And trust me, those little red dots and spots out there are not um, representative of the land and the ter traditional territories of our tribes. For example, you'll see Colville up there in the right hand part of the of Washington State, North Central Washington. And that um, from the seven tribes that I'm a member of, there's only one tribe that actually touches on the oak on the uh, west side of the Okanagan River and meeting the Columbia River. So the other tribes are up in the Met Howe up into British Columbia, all the way down below uh, Wenatchee, Peshastan area. So my tribes are very, very broad. Um, so I think it's very important when we are developing land acknowledgements that we engage the tribes so we can learn the true, genuine, traditional territory that your institution resides, that you learn the traditional territory that, in which you live and it will put you work and play. Next slide. This is just give, gives an overview of what our contemporary mapping looks like, but um, that there's only 29 federally recognized tribes and they are, and, and tribes have been investing for some time in education to build capacity locally. And so they are actually working with 295 public schools, K-12 schools across Washington state, not counting the private, uh, nine educational service districts, uh, seven, there are seven tribal compact, state tribal compact schools, and there are two tribally controlled schools. Uh, there are six public universities that uh, tribes are, are partnering with and working with around research projects and other professional development um, succession planning programs that have been identified and needed within the local tribes. And we have 34 community and technical colleges, which I say should be the natural marriage because our workforce, probably 80% of our workforce are not going to be um, uh, skills set that uh, we have transfer, we need transfer degrees. Um, we actually need um, nurses and uh, tech, uh, uh, tech, technical folks, um, uh, dental assistants, teach teachers, CNAs, early childhood staff, construction workers, plumbers, electricians. There's all kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, folks that we need out there in our tribal communities. Next slide. Thank you, Christina, for, for changing the slide. I just shared this um, because if you take a look at the, this data from um, what uh, uh, the EDI office ha has presented, um, and you see the American Indian Alaska Native, you can look in 2016 and see the enrollment at that time for self-identified uh, students. And it was over 6,000, 6,200. And then you look at fall of 2021 after the pandemic. Um, and the pandemic, you know, that was, you know, uh, uh, 2020, 2021. Well, the, you know, the numbers have been going down. It did go up in 2019, but it dropped off again. Um, and this is a concern. My, my biggest concern probably is not looking at the data and seeing how many folks have, have uh, um, the less amount of uh, enrollees, but more about the identification of who, who are, who are self-identifying as American Indian or Alaska Native. So there has been a movement for a, over since 2000 census on, on making sure that we are identifying American Indian, Indian populations by their local tribe. And so in Washington state, most of the universities now have uh, a place where if I'm registering, even as an employee, as an employer, me as an employee, I put down American Indian and I'm also am able to identify that I am a call bill so that all that data goes right back to the call, call bill so they know where their people are, where they're working and that, that data is, is more reliable. 
So that uh, so we are concerned about that, and I I am aware that the data governance group has um, um, uh, proposed uh, this this new approach along with OSPI and and the Department of Early Learning and other um, state agencies. So this this is all good news. Next. And we see faculty, um, again, it looks a little bit better than what we would expect. Part of this is because um, for the past 10 and 15 years, we've had uh, different colleges of ed uh, operate federal grants on graduate uh, teaching um, programs. So University of Washington, WSU, uh, Gonzaga have had all had um, indigenous or tribal um, uh, leadership uh, graduate programs, and, and we are actually hiring some of those folks into our system, but they're being hired under soft money like grants and things like that. And we really need to be hiring full time uh, tenured faculty. Uh, we need to be hiring staff. We need to be, you know, we need more representation in, in the community technical colleges. And my hands are up to everyone uh, like Cascadia, who just advertised for their first tribal liaison in American Indian Indigenous Studies instructor. I'm excited about the, that good work. Next slide. This is just a, a final image of looking at where we're at today. So we know that um, our early learning office uh, through the state um, is at the top of this image, uh, that the big circle represents the 29 tribes and all those relationships and services that are going um, into these, these, these tribes. Um, and, the, and the little circles on the outside are the outside agencies. So over on the right, the peach color, salmon color is OSPI K-12. Um, they've actually been working with uh, Washington State tribes for going on four decades. So they've been really entrenched. They have an advisory board that with a uh, uh, Office of Native Education that reports directly to Chris uh, Reichdahl, the superintendent of public instruction. And the early learning has an advisory board that has a director, tribal director that reports directly to the secretary. Um, over to the left is the purple, and those are all the four-year public universities, and they have tribal um, uh, uh, advisory boards also that report to their presidents, and they usually they have annual meetings with their board of trustees, and or the board of regents, I should say, and um, they have an advisory board as well. And down at the bottom is, is the Washington State Community Technical College System. And we are actually just starting to get into the circle. So that big circle is providing lots of uh, consultation and, and building formal MOUs and MOAs and creating American Indian Studies programs and uh, creating reciprocal relationships that have been beneficial to all community members and schools and um, uh, businesses and enterprises. Uh, but the bottom circle is, is where we need to formalize that relationship and we need to get inside that circle. And so that we're working on it. And many of our community technical colleges are doing great things out there. And we plan to highlight those best practices um, and, and provide a conference uh, in the fall for, for other colleges. So we're looking forward to that. We've, we've had some webinars and some other uh, good things, but this is all about student success and, and that we don't mean just uh, American Indian student success. We mean all, all student success and faculty and staff. So thank you so much for listening. Lim Lim, next slide. And we hope our libraries end up with uh, authentic stories from our traditional territories like these that are in this image. Lem Lem, thank you. Great, thank you to both Lynn and Dr. Richardson for your good work in the in thinking, helping our colleagues think about how to incorporate some of the guided pathways initiatives that have been going on across our college system, especially around the, the thoughtfulness and the intentionality around these work plans that have been built already, uh, really reaching into that and being thoughtful of how that could be integrated into the DEI strategic plans. And then of course, very much so RCW 43376 that Lynn pointed to uh, a number of times and the opportunity, the rich opportunity in this moment in time for colleges to really, really be intentional about how they can incorporate that into their plans their DEI strategic plans as well. So really important opportunity. We don't want to miss it. Uh, and also to being uh, 
we hope to be able to provide some flexibility so that colleges can think about incorporating that um, after the July 30th deadline as well. So um, please be thinking about how these the intersection can happen across uh, all these three areas that are represented in front of you with guided pathways, the tribal relations work, and then of course, how uh, Senate Bill 5194 and our team um, can come into that with you. So with that, I am so excited uh, to uplift the good work of our college leaders that I mentioned uh, represented here today, Whatcom Community College, Walla Walla Community College and Everett Community College as they share the work that they've been doing in regards to this particular area of their DEI strategic plans and how they've been leading that effort on their campuses. So with that, Christina, thank you. You're so fast. Uh, so Watkins Community College, I am so honored uh, to introduce Terry Thayer, who is the Director for Community Standards and Res Life and also uh, stepped into the gap as the Interim College Equity Officer in the last year or so. Uh, thank you, Terry, for that. It's been a joy to work alongside you um, and learn from you too. So I'm just really excited to have you here and I'm just gonna go ahead and hand it off to you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Terry and I'm at Whatcom. I have a several roles that I've taken on um, over the last couple years. Uh, all been a pleasure, but definitely uh, really figuring things out. I think that we're all kind of trying to figure things out. So um, it's been good work, it's been hard work, uh, and definitely worth it. So I just wanna to touch base a little bit on our strategic plan. Uh, Christina, if you could, perfect. And then click on that link. Um, we're one of the campuses that have an equity component to our strategic plan. And that happened for our 2017-2022 plan. And so what I want us to kind of just look at is the core theme advancing equity. And that's where we're kind of starting our framework from as we continue to build on. And as Hal mentioned, how these plans kind of integrate and intertwine with each other. I think the thing that's great about um, really all of our campuses is the work is happening. It's now then how do we really identify that work? How do we assess it, evaluate it? And then how do we start to push that forward in different ways? So much of what we have in um, expectation for the legislation fits within our overarching goals that we have. Um, but really kind of diving into this work next year as we start to do our planning, look at again, incorporating the equity piece because they're, they're not separate. They, are, they shouldn't be separate. Um, and they should really lean on each other in how we move the work forward. Um, one of the pieces that I think is really um, important to kind of, again, pay attention to as we move forward is now that we've got this kind of as a framework, we get to dive into more of that data, um, figure out what that looks like with our climate surveys, our listening feedback sessions, and how that will also help us build out the plan, right? Getting that feedback, that involvement, understanding how our campus community and our community at large really feels about the work and where they fit into that role. And I'm hoping it pushes and pushes us uh, hard in questions that we need to ask a little bit differently. I have a love-hate relationship with data. Uh, we collect a lot of data. The challenge we have, I think, on our campus is collecting it from those that aren't here. How do we access them? Where do we involve them in the process? Because that's who we want to get here. And, and maybe that's why they're not is because they don't see themselves on our campus. So how do we figure that out? And that requires us to really engage with our community off campus and on campus a little bit differently. I'm also excited because these plans, I see the potential and the creativity of our equity plan development beyond the minimum requirements and expectations set by the state. And there's a lot of great interpretation of this work and the expectations. And so I wanna talk a little bit about what Whatcom's doing in relation to what Lynn has shared and others have talked about around indigenous strategic planning. So we are, I'm gonna go ahead and have you click to the next slide. We are looking at um, creating an indigenous strategic plan as part of our goals for the next year and moving forward. Again, how do these plans work and intertwine with each other. Because as, it, as it's been mentioned, we really can't do that work well if we're not completely engaged. And it requires us to build those relationships. So 
over probably the last three years, we had a group task force that was put together and it began with an inquiry about putting native language on our buildings. And that pushed us to review policy, ask some questions and speak some truths. And that is difficult work, uh, especially when we talk about speaking those truths. This will take time as we continue to build relationships. We do have the privilege on our campus of having a tribal member, a local tribal member on our board of trustees. And that really does allow us to create a different kind of relationship. Um, we need to then reach out to our other tribal um, nations nearby and create that same relationship. Creating the plan, like Lynn mentioned, requires us to include indigenous voices. And that doesn't just mean the ones on campus. It means the ones off campus, those that are local. The other thing that I think it re requires us to reflect on is the privilege that comes with being federally recognized. And when we dive into the system and what it looks like as a system to uphold some of those um, white supremacist traditions and characteristics, that becomes a part of the necessary conversation. I am an enrolled member of the Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation. My people are not here. And yet I'm here because my family needed to be here. They had to move out. They were pushed out and had to go and find other places. And I think that there's something in understanding what that looks like, especially when we dive into urban settings and we look at those agencies that have been created to support and who that all involves. And so we're while we're doing the work of this long-term change, really trying to build this plan, um, there are immediate actions that we are taking and wanna take right away. And so WCC will be creating a land acknowledgement. There are a lot of feels about land acknowledgements. I have a lot of feels about land acknowledgements. <laughs> Uh, it requires conversation and understanding. A land acknowledgement is not just words, but like we mentioned earlier, it's a commitment to action. And we wanna make sure that Whatcom is putting action behind the statement of our land acknowledgement. Um, I think that also needs to be really specific. We have to dive into the detail of that. We can make broad statements of lifting voices but what does that really mean? And what does that look like? We'll also be implementing internal protocols when it comes to working with sovereign nations. When we talk about land acknowledgements, when we talk about internal protocols, that sovereign nations piece is really important. That government to government relations, just like we've talked about and has been mentioned already. When we struggle as a campus to fully understand sovereignty and respect government to government relations. And it's not it's not out of malicious intent. It's sometimes it's, it's so innocent. It's so innocent. As we go and we wanna build these relationships and connections, we don't necessarily understand um, the role that we have as individuals on our campus. And we need to understand what it means to invite an indigenous person to come to campus or participate in an experience. And one of the perfect examples I love to share, and it's a great one because again, it was a good intention. It's a great experience, but I had a faculty member contact me who wanted to invite a native woman to speak in her class. And she wanted to know about an honorarium. And it led us to a great conversation because we talk about honorariums in order to, um, you know, show gratitude for what is being brought by indigenous people. And yet at the same time, sometimes we forget that indigenous people are professionals and they have academic knowledge to bring, they have professional experiences to bring that also intertwines culturally with who they are. And so we started talking about, well, what is the intention and purpose for this person and why they're coming? Who are they representing? Um, are they coming because this is their academic field? And if so, can't we just compensate them as we would any other academic professional who's talking on this topic. And so it was a great conversation that led to the understanding and just the awareness of the complexity of intersectionality of identity, as well as honoring indigeneity. So having internal protocols, I think, kind of sets the stage for a campus understanding what it means to work with a sovereign nation. Um, 
And it's our internals, right? These are not things we're pushing on our tribal communities nearby us. They get to set the stage for that. And we take that lead and we communicate that with our campus and what that looks like. Other actions will, incu will include community collaborations. Uh, we did a project this year with Watka Museum. One of the things that I, is a great passion of mine is trying to, again, bring awareness to the broader community. We hold a lot of things in education, especially higher education. There's a lot of expertise and knowledge and events that happen on our campus, which can be a nice little bubble and shell. But how do we push this out into the broader community? I think understanding who we are as educators and what education does in the potential shift and change of culture and community, this is how this kind of works. Um, and so it was a great project. It was great to be a part of working with many members, um, both on our campus and off our campus. Indigenous art on campus. Um, oftentimes that's located in the library. And I got, I got feels about that. <laughs> One of the things that I think is really important as we continue to work with native individuals is to understand we are not of the past. We are present right here, right now. And art can be anywhere on campus. And it doesn't have to just exist in the library um, where a lot of what we consider to be history. We'll continue to really address what it means to have native language on buildings. How do we represent that well and have those conversations? And I've been thinking a lot about what it means um, of, of, of truth and the impact of colonization. This leads to an understanding of intention and impact, and it leads to true reconciliation when we can be truthful. And we talked a little bit about numbers. Um, I made this statement before. I think one of the things we have to really become aware of is those numbers for Native Indigenous individuals are small, and there might be a reason for that. Education has been used as a tool for a long time. In taking away who we are. And I would say, you know, Lynn mentioned intergenerational trauma, and I think that that still exists. And so when we start to really believe that education is the key to reconciliation, we have to own the truth that as a system, we have educated and trained policymakers, administrators of government, industry and education of the past and present. And these are the leaders who have created harm isolation and destruction of cultures of people. With this truth comes the acknowledgement that education can also create a change for upcoming generations and future leaders that will lead us through healing and reconciliation. Speaking those truths are hard. Speaking those truths are hard to hear, but we have to own it. We have to say it out loud that's the only way we continue to move forward and knowing that our, our impact and the way that we educate, the way that we talk can also shift in a completely different direction. And I think that by bringing in this conversation and, and this plan and this work, we have a great deal of potential to really shift the way equity looks and it feels on our campus. Thank you. Wow, beautifully done, Terry. Education is not just the key to reconciliation, but healing. On the road to that, it's it's been long overdue. So thank you so much for lifting that up um, in all in all the spaces that I know that I've been in with you, and especially today uh, in this space uh, with our um, colleagues across the system too. So thank you so very much for that. I think we're. Cool. I think I saw something, Christina. Oh, thank you for the, the acronym. All right, I want to introduce now Walla Walla Community College and the good work that Margarita Banderas has been a part of there alongside Nick Belusi, who serves as the VP of Enrollment Services, who is not able to be with us today. So Margarita is, is a solo flight in sharing out the work that Walla Walla has lifted up. So I'll go ahead and give that to you, Margarita. Thank you, Ha. 
Thank you, Christina, for helping with the slides. We can go to the next one. Um, as I said, my name is Margarita Banderas. I'm the Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at uh, Walla Walla Community College. And I'm excited to share about um, the strategic planning process that we went through last year and how we're applying an equity lens to what we're doing. Uh, so next slide, please. Thank you. So for a little bit of a framework and uh, background, uh, Walla Walla Community College had had a strategic plan and separate EDI strategic plan, uh, which ex both expired in 2020. Um, at the time, as you know, we were in the middle of the pandemic, and we decided to work with a consultant with Dr. Bob Hughes um, to develop a shorter strategic plan. Um, and the thinking for that was that recognizing the, the situation, the reality that we were all living in, wanting to make sure to uh, focus and align uh, our resources to the current needs of students, not sure what was coming in the near future. Um, the college was going through some leadership changes, uh, but through all of that, uh, there was a clear commitment from uh, leadership from the from the president and the cabinet that we wanted to not have the two plans separate, that we wanted to make sure that equity was embedded through the whole process and through um, our goals and objectives of the strategic planning. So we divided that process uh, into three phases. Um, the first one was a data review and a discussion evaluating all of our needs. Uh, then we were setting our strategic goals and objectives well, with the focus of promoting equity and then figuring out how we were going to translate those goals and objectives into strategic action. Um, next slide, please. So starting with uh, the first phase, um, our review of information and discussion. Uh, the goal here was to gather information and understand the colleges and the community's needs all through the lens of um, how are we serving our community. So the equity focus in all of these was to ask the two questions there on the left of who are we not serving and who is coming to us, but we are not serving them well. So we started a process of uh, understanding and analyzing the demographics of both the college and the communities that we served and then also doing um, a climate and needs assessment to understand um, the, the feedback and the needs. So we did um, a survey of all constituents within the college, students, staff, and faculty, and making sure that um, we were bringing in all the voices, hearing everybody's feedback, as well as a survey of the local communities, local partners, uh, nonprofits that we partner with. Um, and we created spaces to uh, share the, the information that we were gathering, uh, hear feedback, uh, and gather all that information. Um, this was a process that we did over a couple of, of several weeks. And then through all those conversations, there were a couple of themes that uh, came up uh, in those conversations and those surveys, and they're listed here on this slide. Uh, the two uh, first ones, the focus on uh, the cost of attendance and affordability of the college, and also the sustainable allocation of financial resources. Um, as an institution, we had experienced some financial challenges over the last few years. And so that was something that was resonating a lot with the community and clearly came through in the feedback that we were receiving, uh, which connects to the next one, the enrollment management, uh, being able to um, look at our, our marketing, our recruitment of students, but beyond that, looking at the retention and the student supports that we were offering, as well as the class offerings, what was available, when were, when were courses scheduled um, and how they were offered through the modality. Um, a key component that came out through the conversation, especially with the community and understanding community needs was an, uh, a desire to see an increase in promotion of the trades and the workforce programs and elevating that work. Um, and also making sure that the, the education offerings were relevant to the needs of the community and that there was um, clarity and transparency in how that selection uh, was coming through um, in college leadership. Next slide, please, thank you. Um, so with that, with all that information for the second uh, phase of the process in developing the goals and objectives, um, the executive leadership team, the cabinet worked closely with our participatory uh, governance council um, to take all that information, all that feedback and develop draft goals and objectives. 
that were then communicated back out to the community for additional feedback and response. Um, again, trying to bring in all the voices and be inclusive of what we were hearing um, throughout uh, all the constituents. Uh, it was right around this time last year, uh, at the end of our spring, that uh, our Board of Trustees approved the, the final goals and objectives with a strong focus on promoting equity. The idea was to have three goals um, that provided the focus of our work and then objectives that established expectations of that work. Um, so I'll go through those uh, really briefly, um, just to give you a framework of where we landed for our work. Uh, thank you. So for the first goal, uh, WWCC will provide high quality pathways for education and training for all students to meet the needs of our communities. Um, and the three goals below that, I'm not going to read all of those, you can go do that yourselves. But again, emphasizing the um, the desire that uh, the, the needs that came through in those assessments that we were trying to hear from the community, of making sure that we were um, that we were being flexible in the modalities and on the uh, scheduling opportunities that we had for our, for, our, for our courses, that we were thinking about the, the student recruitment, the retention, um, the student success, thinking about who wasn't in the room, who wasn't in the classroom, and what were the opportunities for moving forward with um, transfer education as well as uh, job placement right after um, college and making sure that we were being thoughtful about developing pathways and connections um, that were relevant to the needs of the community uh, that we serve, being able to assess those needs uh, regularly um, to create those opportunities. Next slide. So for the second goal, again, I've mentioned that the concern about um, financial sustainability. So WWCC will be a fiscally sustainable organization. Uh, there was a lot of uh, emphasis in terms of making sure that we prioritize our um, outreach, um, marketing and recruitment. Uh, as all other colleges in the state, we've seen a decrease in an enrollment and there's an, an emphasis and focus in terms of um, reevaluating how we're doing that outreach being a lot more uh, culturally relevant, uh, culturally responsive, recognizing that our communities are changing and who is in the community and who do we need to be focusing on in terms of our outreach and recruitment. Um, there was a lot of uh, desire in hearing more about how we were being uh, clear and transparent in our decision-making processes. So a lot of communication in terms of building that as well as um, being able to commit to our strategic priorities and directing resources based on those needs as we were seeing them through the community. And then our third goal, thank you, um, has, it has a stronger connection to that sense of belonging. Uh, WWCC will be welcoming, inclusive, supportive of, and responsive to all communities we serve with four objectives under this one, with the two first objectives being um, very internally focused and the third and fourth more outwardly focused. So a lot of um, uh, focus and desire to making sure that we're creating spaces where everybody feels uh, heard, valued, and supported, but with an emphasis in recognizing that we haven't done a good job of that for um, historically underserved populations and making sure that we correct that um, trajectory from the past mm -hmm. and making sure that we uh, foster trust and, and transparent communications internally. And then the Third and fourth goal objectives, I'm sorry, looking more at outwardly our community partners, making sure that we were um, building those connections, building the, the pathways and programs to be able to think about what the community needs and how we're being responsive to those needs um, and being um, involved in a respected voice in the conversations and the communities that we serve. So with those approved, we moved on to the third phase of our strategic planning, which is how do we take action based on this great goals and objectives that we've developed, knowing that uh, we wanted to make sure that it, it was all equity centered. Um, through that process, we had conversations about what does organizational success look like? Um, and it was defined by what are we doing um, to address the needs um, that we see in the community 
and how do we measure how we're doing in terms of addressing those needs. Um, in all of our conversation, it was very important to think about like defining that organizational success, but knowing that it's all about the people. So the way that we define success is when the community, the people that come to us, employees, students, visitors, when they come to our institution, are they accomplishing what they came here to do? And that is how we define that success. So next slide, thank you. And again, I wanna bring up the two central questions that were guiding a lot of our conversation through all of this, the who's not here that could be here, again, assessing our um, community needs and who is in the community and who is not at the college and who is coming here, but not being successful. Um, these two questions were informed by the larger question of focusing on are there groups of people, populations who aren't being successful because of barriers that we can eliminate. That process of introspection and really taking a hard look at ourselves at the things that we are doing and how we can correct um, policies, practices that um, can lead to barriers and can we fix that. So that led us to, next slide please. Thank you. Uh, this was a template of um, an, developing an action plan that Dr. Bob Hughes left with us, left with us to have each individual um, department, unit, area go through this process to look at the strategic goals and objectives and then develop a, a work plan of what each of them could do to affect the change um, directed towards strategic plans. So it was six steps. Uh, so it started with define what each department wants to learn or accomplish. So that meant um, each area being able to look at the goals and objectives uh, from the strategic plan and deciding which ones lined up the most with the individual unit and then prioritizing with the idea of each department choosing uh, two or three uh, goals slash objective sets that they can work towards. Uh, then step two, identifying where they are and succeeding. So asking a lot of questions about what are the, the barriers that exist within their area that are hindering people from doing what they need to do? Uh, what are institutional barriers that are keeping that department from doing what needs to be done? What are um, outside barriers that are uh, hindering the work of that unit from addressing the problem? So there was a lot of encouragement of having conversations and asking questions and being very introspective rather than just rushing, rushing to solutions. With step three, uh, look to see if there are groups of people who aren't being successful. So again, that analyzing of populations after you've identified the potential barriers, um, who is not participating or um, accessing the services of a specific department, uh, identifying if there are groups or populations who um, are participating in that program or department services, but they're not succeeding, uh, who, are, who are populations that are struggling, and also identifying if there are groups that are succeeding at higher rates to be able to understand where those gaps are. So that is looking at the numbers and then moving on to uh, item four, um, discovering the experiences of those people who are in succeeding. So this is going beyond the, the simple uh, numbers assessment of final success, but looking at all the steps in between, getting information from students, employees, visitors uh, to better understand their actual lived experiences um, and being very vulnerable at that point in terms of interrogating current practices that lead to inequities um, and being willing to ask questions about who uh, is succeeding um, and being collaborative, uh, talking openly about where you see some of those inequities and trying to find solutions for the individual unit, which leads to step five, the creating solutions to the barriers. Um, again, identifying both um, other departments or processes within the college or externally across the state or across the nation who's doing this well, who can we learn from and um, being willing to adapt and change on um, the current practices that we are um, using. Um, and then implementing those potential solutions and changes and then being willing to measure not just the final outcome, but along the way to be able to make adjustments and corrections as needed. Um, and then ideally you know, removing that, that, that barrier and starting the process all over again 
um, as we know, education is a process of inquiry and change, and there's always something that can be adjusted. So being able to cycle back again on that um, process. Um, Perfect, thank you. Uh, so then that's where we're at right now. Uh, departments at the college developed those uh, equity work plans through last fall and are implementing them this uh, winter and spring and doing those assessments and reevaluations. And along the process they're doing that, we're also looking into the future. Like I said, we did a short strategic plan um, for, for this process. Um, so it'll expire next year in 2023. So this summer, fall, we will be looking at starting a comprehensive strategic planning process that will create an opportunity for re-examining our uh, institutional mission, vision, and values, uh, doing some SWOT analysis. Um, we will be doing the DEI campus climate assessment in the fall that will help inform a lot of this process as well, along with listening and feedback sessions. Um, and we're hoping to align this a lot more too with our accreditation schedule and timeline. Um, and the last piece that I want to mention, the next slide, please, where um, as we've been following this, um, the equity work plan templates that we've been using from Dr. Hughes uh, and thinking about our accreditation process and this next phase of the strategic planning, we are launching um, a purposeful assessment of mission fulfillment review that uh, aligns a lot of things that we've been trying to do in separate silos and bringing it all together. Um, developing a tool to apply to um, all college departments and programs to be able to measure our progress towards that mission fulfillment uh, to identify and address gaps in programs. Uh, actually, this morning, our cabinet, our um, ELT, just uh, formally passed it as an institutional policy, this, this process that we're starting. And it'll uh, be a uh, two-prong approach. We will have annual program reporting. So everybody's doing regular checkings, uh, evaluating their equity work plans and how the program is doing. But then we'll do a more in-depth review for, for areas um, every five years. Um, and those, so that's where our process is at for next steps. Um, and I'll stop there um, and just be open for any questions. I think Jennifer Johnson has a question. No, I was clapping my hands. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh thank Fly you. going by. <laughs> Any questions for Margarita? It looks like not, Margarita. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so very much. I wouldn't be surprised if folks will be reaching out to you, though. Absolutely, I'm here to help. Yeah, no, I I really appreciate sort of those central questions that you lifted up and amplified, and that is to continually asking ourselves who's not here, who who has not been invited to the campfire, um, and then of those who are here who have not been successful as a result of things that we've done, um, and then also then taking it to to that bias for action of what what can we do now, what can we do about that now that we know this, so that that to me really landed. Margarita, so thank you so much for those reminders. I think the other thing that I want to um, amplify with this group is the the uh, example of the prime opportunity that Walla Walla has right now in regards to the work that you've already begun and, and thinking further into integrating that into the next iteration of the overall college plan, uh, but then also really utilizing so that flexibility right now with the climate uh, campus climate assessments to think about when is the best time for your college to conduct those assessments such that you have those findings in place, uh, such that the findings are meaningful in the development of this next iteration of your college plan uh, towards uh, so that it meets uh, is fully integrated in that, so a well informed in that process, but also considering what that means to measure success, and the metrics around that, and what it looks like to meet mission fulfillment of the college. So, thank you for pointing out all of those areas. I think there's uh, colleges maybe on the Zoom that are in that place too. I don't know if I saw Shoreline here, but I think Shoreline has the same uh, sort of time uh, frame and opportunity in that same way. So, thank you for sharing that. 
Okay, well, with that, the closer college here of Everett Community College, we've got two wonderful representatives of Everett today. That's Andrew Santos and Dr. Heather Meyer, who is here. I don't know, Lisa. Lisa, are you here as well? I'm here as well. You are. Lisa is also here. So thank you for, for joining us. So I'm just going to go ahead and hand it off to uh, the trio of Everett Community College today. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's see. Okay, perfect. Here's ours. Um, so my name is Andrew Santos. Uh, you know, I've been at EVCC for about four and a half years now um, in various different roles. Um, and so, you know, I had the, I guess, uh, I'm not going to say privilege, uh, honor of, um, you know, being chosen to create a new strategic plan for our college. Um, I will preface this as saying we definitely got lucky um, in the timing of this planning process with the new legislative bills coming out. Um, and so luckily um, we were able to only make minor alterations to our strategic plan in order to have them fit the new um, Senate bills that were passed. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. Um, one of the things we wanted to do from the start is to include as many stakeholders as possible. Um, you know, call it a radical idea if you will, but you know, students, employees, people on the front line, community members, um, they know, you know the issues that they're facing. They know some of the roadblocks, the barriers, um, and things that are affecting student success, uh, employee and uh, retention, you know, all types of things. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that uh, we were getting those voices um, as we were you know, creating this whole new strategic plan. Um, so what we ended up doing was, you know, creating these stakeholder meetings um, where, um, you know, we separated them out where campus uh, leadership could get a, you know, had a separate meeting where it was basically, um, you know, associate deans and up um, where they could provide feedback, um, some of their, um, you know, come up with ideas for what our strategic priorities are going to be. Um, we created a separate one for um, faculty and staff. Um, where we created these spaces, as well as for students and then community members are separate. When we created these spaces, we wanted to make sure that we were going to get, you know, good, honest feedback. We, um, you know, didn't want anybody to feel like pressured to just say like nice things and, you know, talk about how, you know, well, everything was going um, and things like that. We wanted some real, um, you know, constructive feedback and things that we can focus on in the next coming years. So, um, you know, we started out with these, uh, activity, uh, you know, different activities to kind of get this engagement from all of our involved stakeholders. Um, and so, uh, you know, whether it was, um, you know, the vision statement, our priorities, uh, you know, anything like that, um, we wanted to get as much input as possible, especially from students. Um, so, you know, creating those, uh, those um, opportunities for input and engagement were extremely um, helpful, you know, not only in creating our focus, um, but also in creating, you know, our priorities, objectives, things like that. Um, so, um, you know, I would say that was probably one of the most successful and beneficial things that we did. So that way you can ensure that, um, you know, all of your stakeholders have a voice and that it's not just coming from the leadership. So that creates a better sense of buy-in from everybody involved. Um, and that, um, you know, even that's part of the process of ensuring that your strategic plan um, won't just become another poster on the wall that everybody ignores. That was one of the big things, you know, that I harped on quite a bit during this whole process was, you know, I've been at multiple different institutions, um, you know, both in and out of Washington. Um, and at basically every single one uh, I've been to the strategic plan, the vision statement, the mission statement, it's really just a poster on the wall that everybody walks by every single day. Um, so we wanted to create ways to ensure that this won't become that, that this will actually be a guiding principle going forward um, with our budget, with our hiring processes, with our outreach and recruitment processes, everything like that, um, to make sure that we are really instilling these values into um, our college. Um, and I think Heather's gonna go over that a little bit later in the presentation of different things we did to uh, make that possible in phase two. Um, but this was kind of just our beginning work for phase one. So once we did these engagement sessions, um, if you could go to the next slide, we were able to, um, you know, center equity 
as the you know heart and soul of our strategic plan. Um, <clears throat> and then we were able to um, create priorities and objectives from that um, central piece um, to ensure not only student success, but faculty and staff retention, um, you know, all types of things like that. Uh, sustainability, not only, um, you know, financial st 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 sustainability, but, um, you know, uh, employment, retention, all types of things. We tried to make sure that this was an, all as en encompassing as possible. Um, and so this is really what we ended up coming out with. Um, so this is basically just a big overview of what we, um, you know, putting equity at the center and making sure that everything not only blends and um, comes together with equity, but also blends with each other. So, you know, we um, want to make sure that, you know, students are feeling belong, like they have a sense of belonging, um, but we also want to make sure that they're ready, um, you know, career connected, that they're ready for um, the workforce to be um, members of our community um, and things like that. So we just wanted to make sure that everything blends together. That way we are not overlapping with our resources, uh, with our time, with our, um, you know, all types of things like that. Um, so we really just wanted to create a lens where we can basically examine everything that we're doing at the college to make sure that it um, aligns with our priorities. Um, so with that, I'll pass it off to um, Lisa and she can talk about what our priorities and objectives ended up being. So honored to be with you um, all this today. Um, this has just been an awesome opportunity. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say that and just the amazing presentations and speakers that we had, Dr. Richardson and uh, Dr. Holder er earlier and just um, the other colleges and everything. I just wanted to let you guys know that uh, this has been a very awesome uh, and impactful presentation. And I thank you for the honorable and amazing work that you know we all are doing collectively for our students. And so with me uh, being an executive assistant, uh, this was my very first deep dive into um, doing anything remotely like strategic planning. This was truly baptism by fire. And um, I really, really, I enjoyed it immensely. I really did. I kind of have a twofold experience with Everett Community College. Um, as a staff member, and I was actually a student and graduated in 2018. So I was able to provide, you know, perspectives from a different lens of being a student, uh, a woman of color, um, I'm African American, and a non traditional student on top of that. So there was a lot of layers that, um, uh, you know, we addressed when it came to things like that, because um, those types of things are representative of students that we have on campus. And so uh, in developing like our mission statement um, and our vision statement, uh, Andrew uh, spoke about the engagement sessions that we had for that. They were amazing. Um, so in support of our key stakeholders, our students, we really had to garner that critical foundation base uh, with our executive leadership team. Um, we wanted to come up with a statement to let students know from the moment they hit this campus and before, we are vested. We are vested in you, we are vested in your success. And those engagement ses sessions birthed out those two statements, um, our, our mission statement and our vision statement. And um, it really speaks to um, our uh, capabilities that we have uh, here on our campus and our capacities to serve our students. Uh, we are looking at, we looked at key performance indicators, you know, as measurements is how we measure our success here at the college. And what really um, was awesome for me to participate in was the in, uh, community engagement sessions. Uh, those were like really awesome. And uh, our leadership team session that we had uh, was very exploratory. And uh, the surveys that were taken uh, by students, community and, and our staff members. Um, for me, I really wanted something impactful to connect back to our students. Um, I just didn't want to come up, it's like, I don't want to come up with a pretty glossy statement, you know, and, and like Andrew uh, talked about and just hang something on the wall. I wanted something to connect back to the students where they could see themselves um, on this campus. When I first got to this campus, I didn't even know what our strategic plan was and if, if we even had one. And so I want students to be like more aware of it 
I want it to be definitive and so that they could see themselves as a success at this college. And if we're really blessed, they could come back and teach at this college or speak at this college. So after all of these things, and I won't keep you long, um, there are other things that have spun off um, with a lot of high level communication that we had about the strategic plan. We did develop um, a campus climate survey with an outside vendor um, that was pretty successful. I believe that we had, and uh, you guys can chime in. I believe we had over a thousand responses, which was just absolutely amazing. And what also transpired was that we did a podcast. Uh, it was only eight minutes long and uh, we did that. And that was awesome as well, it was very well received. And one of the amazing things that happened after this too, and this was much deliberation, uh, we had a, a program manager for our place of our way. And some of you folks in community will know what that is. And I'm gonna say the, the name wrong, but I believe it's called Haidache. Uh, the place of our way here on our campus. I don't know if any of you knew this, but it had been closed down for two years throughout the pandemic and we had to close due to COVID um, and we just didn't have the funding. Or I can just tell you and I can just raise my hands and just say it is back open. It is back open and that is just phenomenal. And uh, there is uh, an amazing team member that we have. Her name is Kimberly Krause. And she is our program manager for Place of Our Way. So all of that to say that we're moving forward and uh, the future is looking really bright for us here at Everett Community College. And I'm just so thankful that we have collaborative partners as all these folks on this screen. And uh, I, I am just looking forward to working with you even more as we um, give these soft handoffs to these folks and just say, run with it, go do the work, be inspired. And I'm truly inspired by all of you. And I will hand it off to Heather. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, my name is Heather Mayer and I'm the Interim Associate Dean of Teaching and Learning. Um, and I joined this process a little after Elisa and Andrew went um, the engagement sessions had already happened. Um, I participated them as, with them as, as an employee, um, but I had not uh, joined in on the planning of those. Um, Christina, can you go forward? I think two slides. Um, so that's the vision statement we came up with, the core values. Um, so one more slide forward to get to those strategic priorities that Andrew mentioned. And so, you know, really these, these things came from you know, the focus on equity was there from everyone we talked to every you know the campus the community the students um so it was not hard to you know to to make this something that fit along with what was required as well because those things kind of came naturally and so what we built in was this kind of iterative iterative process of coming up with these priorities and the goals and the specific objectives for each of those um that would help us kind of move this forward. And so I won't read you all of these. Um, you can, our strategic plan in full is also in the, Google, the shared folder. So you can read um, what specific objectives we came up with to measure, but you know, we, we wanted to be clear to make them very specific, measurable race, con race, race conscious objectives um, that really brought us forward from things that could be kind of generic statements. So every kind of layer of the plan kept getting more and more specific. So you can see that if you wanna look at our full plan. Um, next slide. Um, so again, those are the second ones that, that Andrew mentioned earlier, sustainability and career connected and just really building in those specifics from there. Um, and so that the strategic plan was approved by the board in I think it was December of last year. And so if you wanna to go to the next slide, Christina, this is where we currently are is in the phase two implementation phase, which, you know, is always invigorating and challenging. We have a, you know, we have an interim president now. We've got um, some interim or vacant, vacant positions on our leadership team. And so this is really where, you know, we try to figure out how do we make this plan work? Um, so securing executive sponsorship. Um, we're very clear that, you know, this, this plan does not live with the 
equity and social justice division. Um, you know, this this plan rests with with every area of the college, and every area has to have ownership of it. Um, so identifying guiding principles using a shared equity leadership framework and aligning the budget review process with the strategic planning process. So that's really the phase that we've just kind of been going through. Um, and, and that's really building in, you know, transparency around what how the process looks. There was originally a, a step to try to have, you know, new position requests, you know, have people say what part of the strategic plan it aligns with. And that didn't really give the leadership team the information that they needed to move forward. So they expanded out a, a cross campus group of representatives to really look at the strategic plan, look at um, you know, position requests and have a kind of framework to look through together to say which of these things really move forward in achieving these objectives. And so that's kind of where we are in this process right now of, of aligning, um, aligning it with the budget process. Um, also, you know, aligning the activities and initiatives that we are, are have already been underway for the last few years, but making sure that they're connected in with a strategic plan and looking, working with institutional effectiveness to identify how we know we're making progress and then how we're reporting that out to the board of trustees, because they were very specific again, and we want these to be measurable and we want to know as we're going forward, how well we're doing in meeting them. So those are the, the pieces that are currently in process right now. Um, with our plan, but you can uh, take a look at, at the plan in full if you'd like to see the specifics there. And then um, you can feel free to contact any, any member of our team if you have questions about that. Uh, Dr. Phyllis Esposito, our VP of Equity and Social Justice, couldn't be with us today, um, but, but we're all happy to answer any questions about how the process looked you know, to get there and what it's looking like now as we are trying to um, implement what we set out in the strategic plan. That is great. Thank you so much, uh, Team Everett, in sharing that. You know, Heather or Dr. Meyer, you you mentioned something that I think was really uh, also a very good reminder uh, for us and for everyone else in this room, and that is the collective nature and the capacity of the work and the approach that Everett took. That this work doesn't land just in the um, diversity, equity, and office uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion office on your campus. Right, that this is the work of the executive team um, and that it's built at the, those layers as well. Uh, also being really grateful for the approach that Everett took in including the voices of many individuals across the campus. Elisa, you are, you are a force. I appreciate everything that you, you shared, you know, you know, as a, in your experience and your perspective as a student, and now co colleague in our system, appreciate that uh, perspective that you brought into that and Andrew, your leadership in this space as well. So thank you so incredibly much for, for sharing the work that Everett's done. Certainly Everett is one that has uh, really taken on this work and leveraged it forward uh, again, prior to any legislation coming, uh, coming up and bubbling up in that way. So thank you for being proactive and doing that and sharing what you've, you've been able to pull together as a campus whole in this work. So with that, I'm looking at, uh, Christina, if you wouldn't mind, yes, on <laughs> the question slide, yes. Well, it's like, it's as if you've read my mind. <laughs> I was gonna ask you to do those very things that you just did without uh, being asked to do. So thank you for that. Uh, but I just wanna leave some space for any comments or questions that anybody might have for myself and my team. Um, as well as the broader state board team that was represented here, um, and then of our uh, college leaders as well. So as, if there's any comments or questions that you might have for us. And I'm sort of scanning across to see if I'm missing anyone. Looks like maybe not. How about uh, Team SPCTC, Claudine, I know you're still here, or any of our uh, college leaders and presenters, if there's any last words you might want to lift up in this space before we close.
Thank you, Jennifer. I think just a quiet group today, or we did so well presenting all this information. There are no gaps whatsoever. You don't have any questions at this moment in time. Uh, but as uh, things, oh, I'm also seeing something pop up. Thank you, Christina, for giving access again to those documents. So with that said, I think if there are any questions or inquiries that emerge as a result of some of this work that you're putting into play or being a part of on your campus, feel free to reach into my team at any time. Um, if we can't answer the question for you, we'll do our darndest to be able to seek that question, uh, the, re the answer down for you and or reach into individuals who may already have that. So with that, thank you so very much for taking the time to be in this, I want to again thank each and every one of our college leaders who came into this space with us today, Andrew and Heather and Lisa from Everett, Margarita from Walla Walla, and of course, Terry Thayer from Watcom and Claudine and um, Lynn who had to leave us, incredible partners in this work at the state level, can't thank you both enough. So with that being said, thank you so very much. We're here if you need anything, feel free to reach out directly. Hope to intersect in person with each and every one of you soon.